uh, dear students good morning good afternoon good evening all good uh, in the previous class we stopped at agency problem agency problem which arises uh, when shareholders actually they believe that decisions of bod they have not led increase in shareholders wealth now the question is what are those decisions and what about directors do they make such decisions intentionally or unintentionally or is there any solution that we can prevent directors not to make such decisions which will not increase the wealth of shareholders in fact which may decrease the wealth of shareholders so let's check these are the examples of decisions that may damage shareholders well number one is director pay normally the director pay is too high is too high so that is why a majority of the shareholders they believe that's unfair the director pay is too high second taking high risk business decisions actually sometime what happens your directors they have to take high risk business decisions but if those decisions prove wrong then definitely business faces large losses and sometime even survival of the business becomes questionable let me give you the example of this taking high risk business decision the best example of this is blackberry there was a time that blackberry first introduced an introduce an email uh, option in a cell phone that in that cell phone you were able to receive the email send the email so that particular cell phone of blackberry got famous in especially in business community like a wild fire the cell phone that particular cell phone of the blackberry got really big success everything was going fine in blackberry but what happened as soon as there mobile phone got famous in business community blackberry and other they started hearing uh, news that samsung and iphone they are about to launch smartphones so at that time blackberry had to make a decision either to stop the production of their existing cell phone which was famous successful and all together just moved to smartphones or no need to move to smartphones and just stick to their existing cell phone designs so at that time blackberry made the decision that they are not going to the smartphone they will stick to their existing uh, cell phone design then the history says blackberry was wrong so in today's world in smartphones obviously the two names are really big names one is obviously iphone apple and another is samsung so we do not have any third name which is such a big as compared to these two giants so the decision of blackberry was wrong so today in today's uh, technology world we cannot see blackberry anywhere another example could be nokia nokia was too late too late to shift on android technology so you can see that again there is nowhere nokia nowadays the company was sold in the 
CFO was crying. He was he said nothing. When the CFO of Nokia was crying at the time of uh, selling the company, he said nothing was wrong in the company. Just they made the wrong decisions. They were late to decide to go to Android. So sometimes, obviously, businesses they take high risky business decisions. But if those decisions prove wrong, then obviously business faces really large uh, losses, and sometimes they are not repairable. Like in case of Nokia and BlackBerry, they are not repairable. Third, non-payment of dividends. If your shareholders were expecting the dividend because of the past history of the company, and they did not get the dividend, then obviously they will think their wealth is damaged. So non-payment of dividends does result shareholders thinking that their wealth have damage because company uh, did not pay the dividend. Especially if this issue arises when shareholders were expecting the dividend because if you are a shareholder of a company, uh, let's say you are holding shares of APLC for 10 years and the, and in the previous 10 years every year you got the dividend. So year number 11 obviously you will be expecting to get the dividend again. But if you don't get the dividend in year number 11 then obviously you are going to think that your wealth is damaged. Fourth, using debt finance against the wishes of shareholders. If the company is taking too much debt finance against the wish, obviously when you're taking uh, going towards debt finance against the wishes of shareholders, then again shareholders they think that their wealth is being damaged because debt using debt finance against the wishes of shareholder means if you have already taken the loan and you want to take more loan, obviously the more loan you are going to take being in company, you have to pay more in trust and shareholders they will feel they may feel that after paying in trust company may not be having enough funds to pay us dividend so simply when you are using debt finance against the wishes of shareholders this is another example that shareholders may think that their wealth is being damaged now the question is uh, what is the solution how can we prevent directors not to make such decisions which shareholders may think they they damage the wealth of shareholders? The solution is company law. Obviously, when you are uh, you are a director of a company, you have to follow the company law. Third, is, second is the corporate governance rules for BOD, and the last one is share option, which is in too much detail in AFM. Share options. A very important topic of AFM. Right now we'll be studying a little bit, but towards the I think after three or two, three or four topics, inshallah we'll be studying in in detail this topic share options in B SOP Black Shell Option Pricing Model. But we'll see that right now. Let me explain you what do you mean by share options. Actually, by giving share option schemes to the directors, company can reduce agency problem. Repeat, by giving share option scheme to the directors, uh, company can reduce agency problem. Now the question is how? In share options, what happens? Organization gives option to the directors, for example, that you can buy uh, shares from us for example let me give you the example let's say company says each of our director can buy 10,000 shares from us exercise price is going to be let's say $10 but you can exercise vesting period is two years means what 
let's say each share on a each director will get 10,000 shares exercise price is $10 by paying $10 per share you will get one share vesting period is two years directors cannot exercise these share options today they can exercise for next two years after into uh, at the end of second year now what happens let's say current share price current share price is dollar 7 and company has kept the exercise price dollar 10 logically in two years time director can exercise their share options and each director will get 10,000 shares and exercise price is ten dollar but logically directors will exercise these share options when in two years time market value share price will be more than ten dollars if share price will be more than ten dollars only then directors will buy these ten thousand shares at the rate of ten dollar repeat this share option scheme will only be exercised by the directors <clears throat> when in two years time the market value of the company is going to be more than ten dollar more than exercise price now the question is how it is reducing agency problem this will reduce the agency problem how directors they know that they will be getting the benefit from the share options scheme only when when in two years time market value is of per share is going to be more than ten dollars so they will do each and everything to increase the share price they will make really good investments so that the share price should increase and let's say in two years time share price goes to thirty dollar so the share which is available for thirty dollar in the stock exchange director will be able to get it for ten dollar so now logically only directors are not going to get the benefit from this share option scheme due to increase in the share price definitely shareholders wealth will increase so by giving share option scheme to the directors what you have done you have you can say incentivize them that they should make decisions in such a way that those decisions should increase share price because in my example director will only get the benefit when the market value of APLC share is more than ten dollars in two years time look at this executive share option executive share option scheme are designed to incentive both managers and members of pod to maximize shareholders wealth this is achieved by granting them right to buy shares right to buy share means call option call option means right to buy we have put option also put option means right to sell we never give put option to our employees to eliminate or to reduce agency problem because put option means right to sell logically put option is going to create agency problem so let me make it simple we don't give uh, put option to our directors to reduce agency problem we give, give them call option call option means right to buy this is achieved by granting them the right to buy shares in their company at a price fixed price the technical name is exercise price but the right cannot be exercised until the date in the future resting period this is known as call option hence the managers and BOD will follow policies that will seek to win the scenario for both of them both uh, for both them and owners these options can be valued from the time being granted up until the time they can be exercised the valuation technique actual option pricing model definitely we will study now we call this AFM not B4 so they have five now let's discuss what are the five key decisions uh, which uh, BOD makes to maximize shareholder wealth BOD must consider the following uh, five decisions
investment finance risk and ethics let me bring more pages after discussing these five uh, decisions dear student we will start our first topic inshallah that is cost of capital just a minute let us see uh, let us discuss these five decisions which bod makes just a minute Number one is investment. Cash is a key resource for a company. It can allocate and use two types of investment. One is organic growth. We will study this. Uh, for example, investment appraisal (NPV). Acquisition is inorganic growth. Obviously, both the topics are in too much detail in AFM. We will, inshallah, study both of these: organic and Acquisition is inorganic growth. We'll study this. Finance. Uh, definitely, in order to make investment, we need finance. Companies need to raise cash to, for three main reasons. Finance to invest stated investment is stated above. Either I am going for organic growth or inorganic growth. I have to make investment, or for making investment, we need finance. Second, to enable the company to pay dividend, and sometimes it happens we need finance so that we can pay the dividend. And the last one is bolster means improve the liquidity position of the business. We need finance. Uh, maybe it is possible there is a requirement of a regulator that you need to have a certain cash all the time. If organization does not have that much cash, so it is very much possible organization may raise the finance just to. Keep that particular uh, uh, finance in their organization, uh, funds in their organization. So there are three main reasons for raising the finance. One is investment, second is to pay dividend, and third is to improve liquidity. Three sources of finance: debt, equity, and Islamic finance, which we will study later on in really good detail. Okay. Past ACC AFM question have tested this area in two ways. But you need to know facts, knowing that the key points of each source of finance and cost of capital. Being able to compute the company's weighted average cost of capital, we study this inshallah. Dividends. Our uh, dear friend, for dividends, let me tell you, uh, entire dividend policy is a topic in our AFM which we will study. As stated above, cash can be allocated to pay dividends to the shareholders. The dividend decisions taken by BOD is not straightforward, as it seems. The creation of the dividend policy is affected by several factors. We will study all the factors. Dividend policy question have prepared on several occasions under the current examination theme. Okay. Risk. The BOD has a responsibility to identify the risk that will affect entity, put into force the risk management strategies. BOD, that's the responsibility of the BOD to identify the risk that will affect entity and put into force risk management strategy. We will study all four major business risk, uh, four major risk areas in AFM. We will study business risk, financial risk, foreign currency risk, and trust rate risk. It is fair to say that based upon the past evidence, the students have found this topic one of the more trying parts of ACCA P4. If there will be substantial amount of time no and notes allocated to this important area, don't worry. Ethics in AFM, dear student. In fact, not only in AFM, you will see in all the professional papers you will get around six to eight marks question on ethics. And it does not come every time ethics question in AFM, but it does come frequently. Maybe after two attempts or three attempts, you may face a six to seven marks question on ethics, which is very easy. The BOD cannot simply make take decisions that maximizes shareholders' wealth and ignore all other stakeholders. They must be aware of how their decision will impact upon others. Simply. Nowadays, it is not all about if your NPV is positive, just make the investment. Actually, 
instead of making the decision only on the basis of financial grounds organization will have to consider non financial grounds as well because it is possible that financially the project is very good but non financially it is going to cause a problem for the society obviously in such uh, projects when we will consider ethics as well so it is possible we might end up by deciding not to make investment because financially project is very good but non financially it is going to create uh, troubles problems for the health of society so on this basis we may reject it candidate must identify the key stakeholders you have to identify in ethics question specify the impact upon them of decision taken by the bod and how to mitigate mitigate these with appropriate strategies mitigate this with appropriate strategies so dear students that was all about a uh, basic discussion let me tell you one thing over here in afm there are 10 deadly sin you are not supposed to make uh, any mistake from those 10 deadly sin so throughout the course i'll be keep telling you whenever the deadly sin comes don't make that do not make such uh, i will point it out which uh, mistake is considered as a deadly sin in afm right now dear student let us start our first topic the name of the topic is cost of capital we call it weighted average cost of capital as well. cost of capital slash vac first and the second dear student you have to write okay the first question is what do you mean by cost of capital and second question is what is the objective of calculating cost of capital repeat the first question is what is cost of capital let me tell you then you need to write first listen and listen carefully i'm i, I want to give answer to this what do you mean by cost of capital actually whenever we want to make investment in a project we have to raise finance and each source of finance will have cost you never get finance from any source of finance without the cost so simply cost of capital represents cost of financing repeat cost of capital simply represents cost of financing now the second point is what is the objective of cost of capital please write in write uh, my dear student objective of cost of capital is investment appraisal repeat objective of cost of capital is investment appraisal if you don't want to make investment if you don't want to make investment so dear students seriously you don't need to calculate cost of capital so if someone asks you what is the objective of cost of capital the answer is objective of cost of capital is investment appraisal so far i have given answer of the two question number one was what do you mean by cost of capital the answer is cost of capital actually represents cost of financing second what is the objective of cost of capital the objective of cost of capital is investment appraisal okay now listen dear in cost of capital if your organization wants to raise finance in the form of equity if your company wants to raise finance in the form of equity then the cost is going to be cost of equity ke ke is cost of equity if your company wants to raise finance in the form of debt loan then the cost is going to be kd 1 minus t repeat if your company wants to raise finance in the form of debt then the cost of your company is going to be kd 1 minus t that is cost of debt after tax now the question is why do we say 
in case of debt finance here that your cost is going to be kd1 minus t cost of debt after tax because when when an organization takes loan obviously on that loan they have to pay interest and actually interest payment results in tax saving interest payment results in tax saving that is why that's why we say cost of debt after tax let me repeat the reason organizations they pay interest on debt and that interest payment results in tax saving that is why we say cost of debt is always after tax that is kd1 minus t third one is preference shares if your organization raises finance in the form of preference shares then the cost is kp cost of preference shares so simply if your company raises finance in the form of equity the cost is k if your company raises finance in the form of debt then the cost is kd1 minus t because the trust payment results in tax saving and the last one is preference shares the cost is k cost of preference shares dear student first we will learn how to calculate ke how how do we calculate kd1 minus c how do we calculate kp after that we will learn we will discuss what is the formula of calculating cost of capital or you can say weighted average cost of capital but before reaching that point we need to discuss how do we how this ke comes kd1 minus c and kp Let's first talk about K. K is cost of equity. Okay. Now listen. For calculating K, for calculating K, we have three models. How many models? What did I say? Three or no, two? For calculating K, cost of equity, we have three models. One is CAPM. capital asset pricing model the second is dvm dividend valuation model we can calculate ke by using any one of the three models the one is capm capital asset pricing model second is dividend valuation model and the third one is mm plus tax equation mm miller and morgani plus tax equation actually mm is the alternative of mm plus tax equation is the alternative of capm capital asset pricing model but how it is in the alternative of capm we'll see this but let me tell you one thing mm plus tax equation cannot use everywhere it is used only in one condition what is that condition we will study later on but i'm just giving you the concept for using mm plus tax equation there is uh, condition if that condition is met that only then we use mm plus tax equation otherwise we don't use mm plus tax equation so we'll see inshallah what is that condition so for calculating k uh, we have three models one is capital asset pricing model second is dividend valuation model and the last one is mm plus tax equation which is the alternative of capm let us now discuss capm capital asset pricing model capm capital asset pricing model let me write the formula first k is equal to rf plus rm minus rf into beta q first k k means cost of equity now listen and listen carefully if k is, is cost of equity for the company for company it is cost can i say for the shareholder it is a return we say this is minimum return required by the shareholder repeat for the company it is a cost but for the shareholder it is a return but this is not the maximum return it is the minimum return minimum return required by the shareholders so let us discuss other inputs rf is risk free investment
आर एफ इज रिस्क फ्री रेट ऑफ रिटर्न आर एस आर एफ इज रिस्क फ्री रेट ऑफ रिटर्न नाउ द क्वेश्चन इज वी मीन बाई रिस्क फ्री रेट ऑफ रिटर्न Uh, risk free rate of return means dear student you made you have made the investment which is risk free now the question is which investment is treated as risk free let me tell you the risk rf is risk free rate of return which means you have made an investment and on that investment you are not facing any risk the example to this uh, rf is making investment in government bonds not any xyz companies bond government bonds if any organization let's say makes investment in government bonds so whatever the return comes from the government bond we will say it's a risk free rate of return so simply rf means risk free rate of return and the example of rf is investment in government bonds RM is average stock exchange return. Average stock average stock exchange return which will be given to you. That's average return on stock exchange. Or average for you. Just a minute. Average return on stock exchange. RF is risk-free rate of return. RM is average return on stock exchange, which will be given to you. RM minus RF. Now listen, RF means risk-free rate of return. Let's say organization has made investment in government bonds. RM means average return on stock exchange. So now the question is, what is the name of RM minus RF? RM minus RF is called equity risk premium. RM minus RF is called equity risk. Why do we say equity? If you buy the share shares of any XYZ company, you will become equity holder. Second, obviously, when you buy the share, you will face risk premium. Premium means over and above something. For example, a risk-free rate of return is six percent, and someone makes investment in a stock exchange, so definitely that person. will be expecting getting more than 6% because without taking any risk that person that individual that company could have earned 6% if they they have chosen to go to the pakistan stock exchange let's say or any other stock exchange so obviously they will be expecting more return than rf so simply rm minus rf is equity risk premium equity that uh, because you you will be a shareholder of that company over in your risk obviously when you make investment in any company's shares then you face risk and the third one is premium premium means over and above something so obviously that shareholder will be expecting getting return more than rf so that is why the name is equity risk premium another name for rm minus rf is market risk premium another name for rm minus rf is market risk premium now listen listen carefully dear student normally in afm i would say 99% of the questions you will be directly having rm minus rf so our examiner i think loves this he does not give you rm separately he directly gives you equity risk premium or market risk premium which is the difference of rm minus rf now what is left in the question that's beta equity What is beta equity? Dear student, before discussing beta, we uh, beta equity we need to discuss beta. Just write please. Beta is a measure of risk. Beta is a 
measure of risk when we say risk actually there are two types of risk one is systematic another is unsystematic repeat beta is a measure of risk when we say risk in AFM we talk about two types of risk one is systematic and another is unsystematic Dear student, for unsystematic risk, you just need to write. Unsystematic risk is a diversifiable risk. Is a diversifiable risk. Unsystematic risk is a diversifiable risk. It is a risk which you can spread, reduce, even eliminate. For example, let's say you have 1 million okay, rupee and you go to the stock exchange. If you invest all entire 1 million in one organization's shares, then we will say you did not diversify your risk. Because if the share price of that particular company goes up, then your 100% investment will go up. If the share price of that company drops, then your 100% investment value will decline. Because you have invested each and everything in one organization shares rather than making a diversified portfolio of investment. So simply unsystematic risk is a diversifiable risk. Now dear student, just you need to write. There are a number of assumptions in capital asset pricing model. I'm just explaining you one of them. Just write. Please uh, write it down please. Write that cap. CAPM capital asset pricing model assumes that CAPM assumes that organization is having a well diversified portfolio of investment cap CAPM assumes that organization is having a well diversified portfolio of investment and due to that well diversified portfolio of investment in capital asset pricing model unsystematic risk is zero repeat in capital asset pricing model, we always assume that investor is having a well diversified portfolio of investment. That is why they are not facing any unsystematic risk. Now let's talk about systematic risk. Systematic risk is not a diversifiable risk. This is not a diversifiable risk. Systematic risk is not a diversifiable risk. You have to face it. Example of systematic risk like political instability. Obviously, your company cannot make political instability to turn it to be stability. So that's that's an example of systematic risk. Which is not a diversifiable risk. If there's political unrest in your country, obviously you have to face it. If macroeconomic environment of your country is not good, so you have to face it. If government of Pakistan, let's say, increases in trust rate, increase increase in interest rate does not have a good impact on business. It has a bad impact on business. But if the government increases the interest rate, one individual company can't do anything. If government of Pakistan increases tax rates, obviously, increase in tax rate you can say erodes or maybe you can say reduces profitability of the company but still you cannot say anything you have to face it because these are all the example of systematic risk okay now listen listen here now let's talk about beta equity what do you mean beta equity one thing is for sure beta equity does not represent unsystematic risk why because in capital asset pricing model, we assume unsystematic risk is zero. It means whatever beta equity is, it, it, it is going to show, it is going to, uh, that beta equity only relates to systematic risk. Why? Because in capital, we have, un, we believe unsystematic risk is zero. So beta equity, we called it beta equity.
So you can say Kuti beta, same thing. Now let's see. You need to just write one line. Beta equity is a measure of systematic risk. Beta equity is a measure of systematic risk, which indicates that, which indicates that how your investment, how your investment will respond, how your investment will respond to the changes in the stock index. Repeat how your investment will respond to the changes in the stock index. Let me repeat the definition you can say of beta equity. Beta equity is a measure of systematic risk which indicates that how your investment will respond to the changes in a stock index. For example, if a strong change goes up by 2% let's say assuming stock chain goes up by 2% and your investment goes up by 4% simply in this example you are earning more than the market index is increased by 2% but your investment is showing the return or is showing the increase of 4% so simply I can say you are getting more than the market you are earning more than the market but listen and listen carefully when stock index increases by 2% your investment increases by 4% so we will say your investment is a riskier investment why why it is riskier investment because if you are earning more than the stock index if you are earning more than the market so if in the future market goes down obviously your investment will go down since right now you are earning more than the market so tomorrow there is going to be something wrong with the market so your share price will reduce you will face this decline in the share price more than the market simply it's a simple formula you are earning more than the market so obviously then in the future you will be losing more than the market so we say your investment is a riskier investment so simply Whenever you come across a scenario where indexes increases less than the increase in the investment, so we will say your investment is a riskier investment. Okay. Now, what I am going to give you, let me give you a really simple uh, question, and I want you to attempt this question. And the next video we will start from this question. RF is six percent. RM is 13. We have beta equity. Second beta equity is 1. Beta equity is plus four zero. So number one beta equity is zero point seven five. Number two beta equity is one. The third is beta equity is one point seven five, and the fourth one is beta equity is zero. I want every one of you dear to calculate KE. You will be having four KE because when beta equity changes, obviously KE will change. So this is a very small question. I'm giving you this as homework. What we are going to do in the next video, number one, we will solve this question. And number two, I will tell you the interpretation of this question as well. Because solving the question is obviously required. But for me, another thing which is uh, more than just solving the question is interpretation of the answers. So in the next class, inshallah, we will be studying this question with the interpretation. So thank you very much for watching this lecture. Have a nice life. Thanks a lot.